Hey everybody, how's it going? I am here with my friend Miro and we are going to talk about sourcing from Pakistan. But before we do that, hi Miro, how's it going? Every day is a beautiful dream. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, you and I have just been keeping in touch like this whole time. Uh, we've been social media friends and I have so many awesome social media friends. Uh, in the e-commerce community and it's so great because you know you learn something from all of them and so i mentioned something the other day about oh i shared a, a story uh, a podcast from my friend robbie about sourcing from mexico and you posted on there that you source from pakistan and so i was like oh miro let's talk about it you know, on, on a live, because there's so many people that might think that that's an interesting opportunity. So thank you for being here. <laughs> no problem. Uh, no problem. Do you mind telling everybody a little bit about you and your journey in e-commerce and how we come to be talking today? Okay, sure. Uh, my name is Miro Pasvik. I own a, uh, I own a supplement brand. And uh, what happened was I had like my background, I used to be a computer guy. I used to have a chain of check cashing stores. So I had a kind of a varied career. Um, so I got into e-commerce originally. Um, just I I found this, well, let me kind of tell this rambling story. So one of my big passions is natural health and natural wellness, right? And there's this type of natural health called homeopathy, which I thought was really, really cool. And I always had problems finding quality remedies because what happens was the remedies are like that you buy in the stores were never really that good. And, and I had a friend of mine brought some over from India and they were really good. I'm like, this is, this is the good stuff, right? Like this is the real deal. And um, I was like looking for another supplier and one of my friends uh, was a homeopath in Canada. And he's like, I got, he goes, I got a supplier from Pakistan that makes these, right? So I sent him out and they sent me some samples. That's kind of what started this relationship. So it started off as like a hobby for me and it kind of morphed into a business which is doing okay. And then I went deep into online with Amazon and Shopify and Walmart and it just blew up. So it went from being a hobby to being like some interesting to holy cow, I'm, you know, I, I'm buying food with this stuff. So it's been great. That's awesome. Yeah, I, it's so great when a business starts based on something, some part, some necessity in your life or um, something that you need because it it becomes like your lifestyle and your way to be able to help other people at the same time. Um, so it, I think it's a really great thing. So how long now have you been, have you had your your supplement brand? Um, I've had it for almost twelve years. I got into online with it about six years ago when I kind of did the transition from like hobby kind of puttering to really trying to make a go of it. So really full time about six years. Oh wow, that's amazing. So how did you get started sourcing from Pakistan? Like, tell me about that. How did that happen? Well, it's really interesting because I hadn't done any import export in a long time. Like I did someone else like my early twenties and you know, I'm 50. So it's actually I'm 51 today. Today's my birthday. So all oh, y'all send really? me a present. You're, it is. You're, you're here with me on your birthday. Like Absolutely. I feel that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, Happy no birthday. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, what happened was I, I had found this supplier of, of these really amazing products. Right. And, and it's so interesting because I had done in, import export. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I just, I ordered my first shipment over and it's so funny because here's some, you know, you meet somebody over the, over the internet, you send a couple of emails back and forth, you have a Skype call and then you wire them a bunch of money. Right. And I don't care who you are. You're thinking I am never seeing this money again. Right. And they're like, yeah, we're doing your labels for you. I'm thinking, sure you are, right? And then like, it's still going on the boat. I go, it's not going on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't know what to expect. And I got the stuff in. And and what happened was like, logistically, the level of the packaging, the artwork was very 1970s, right? So one of the things that we did that really blew up our business was just we repackaged the stuff to American standards with, um, I got like a $10,000 label printer. So we're really like, that's really what turned us around was repackaging the stuff and rebranding it. But the quality of the product itself is just, it's fantastic. Like anything I need, I'll like, hey, give me this, give me this. And they're just like, so it's an amazing relationship with them. Um, a lot of nuts and bolts and stuff. 
like what I find very interesting, and again, I'm doing, like I'm bringing in supplements, right? Is the process of importing something isn't as smooth and easy as they make it seem in all the courses. They're like, yeah, you get a, <laughs> you get a customs broker and you just pay them and they handle everything. No, that's not how it is at all. I mean, I, I, I'm in supplements. So I, every time my stuff comes in, I got to go to the FDA. I'm FDA registered, right? I have to get them like a 30 page document and it's just, and it's like they inspect the stuff. Um, one year I had a ship. So of, you're getting it inspected here in the U S then. Um, what's happening is it's inspected there before it goes out Then it comes in the U S there's a series of paperwork. And the problem is like the FDA, like the customs inspectors, these aren't like you think someone that's inspecting supplements to be like a, someone that had a lab, was a lab work or something else. My last FDA inspector, used to be a toll booth operator on the highway, okay? And they made her into an FDA inspector. Like, there's just, you have to educate everybody along the way. And it's just, but it's such a journey. Like, everything, say the hard part. Sending the money overseas, that's the easy part. Getting the stuff through and everything else is the tricky part. So how did you find this supply? You said, you know, you found this supplier of really great products. But how did you find suppliers and how do you recommend that other people, if they're looking to source any kind of product from Pakistan, what's the best way to find a supplier? Um, I found the supplier by just asking people I knew that were in this specific field. Like I was asking other homeopaths, hey, who, who do you guys use? Who has the best remedies? That kind of stuff. So I got a little bit of research and word of mouth and the name of my supplier, just they kept coming up like these guys are the top guys. Uh, they're one of the biggest guys in Asia. They do a great job, you know, big facility, uh, ISO. Like the ISO 9000 registration, that's a good one because that, that shows they're, they're, they're adhering to international standards, right? And it's funny, when I used to be a computer guy, I used to do ISO audits for people. So I know that it just, it's a big paper chase, but at least it tells you that people can at least do paperwork and follow instructions, right? Yeah, so, that, so ISO 9000, so asking for certifications. Right. Um, and then the other thing is what you said, Miro, that I really love is you said you asked around and you asked other homeopaths like, hey, who are you using? Where are you getting your remedies? And then this supplier kept coming up, right? Uh, the thing is, in ISO 9000, that's a, a worldwide certification. It's, it's worldwide recognized as a standard, right? So it's a good thing to look for. You should always, for anyone sourcing from anywhere, you should always ask your suppliers what certifications they have. And you should be familiar with the different certifications that are standard in your industry. So that's really, really good. A tip that I have for folks when you're looking for suppliers, something that Miro gave here is to ask around. But if you're wondering where similar products are made, go to the store, pick up the bottle on the shelf, read the back, see where it's manufactured, where it's distributed, you know, start making calls like this. Um, it was manufactured for Prime My Body LLC in Carrollton, Texas, right? But I bet that I could call these guys and say, hey, where's this product made? Where is it actually, this was manufactured for them, but who was it manufactured by? Um, and a lot of packaging will give you information about where something was manufactured um, and, you know, and by who, right? Sometimes it'll say manufactured by for this company. So don't be afraid to go out there and read labels, right? Because you might find where your your supplies were made. So how did you go about, were you not nervous about just reaching out to this, this random supplier in Pakistan? And how did you go about kind of getting to know them better and, and vetting your supplier? Well, what happened is I had made contact with uh, different suppliers of this type, uh, mostly in India. India's got a lot, of this, a lot of these kind of guys, right? And the problem I had with, with the India guys was, um, my experience has just been like, you know, it, it was very much, uh, I don't see, there's, there's an arrogance about how they approach it with being like, oh, we have the best, we have this, we have that. And it was a lot more about them than it was about me, right? Mm -hmm. And these guys that have packs, and they're like, hey, Miro, look, what do you need? How can we package this for you? 
we have 400 formulas. We have access to 3,000 different products. Which product mix do you want to start with? Like, like it, was, it was more about, okay, how can we be successful together? And it's been really interesting because as, as I've grown my business, they're like, hey, we, we are okay with you going to other go- – like, I'm the exclusive agent for North America. But they say, look, anywhere else you want to go in the world, we got your back. You want it shipped. You want it packaged. Whatever you need, because we've got we've developed a good relationship over the last twelve years. There's a lot of trust there, right? And my volume has gone up too. I mean, I started off with you know I place an order, I place a small order every two years, right? There was oh a small, wow! There was a bigger order every year, right? And, and now I'm ordering like you know fifteen, twenty thousand pounds at a time. Like I'm getting pretty much a full container on a pretty regular basis, right? And that's something that you you mentioned is that you know, supplier relationships are really important. And when you found a few suppliers in India, you said that there was kind of an arrogance and it was like, almost like they didn't want to work with you. Like you had to kind of sell yourself to them. And that's how that was for me in the US because one of my products is made in the US. And it was very hard to get a supplier in the US. You really have to like get them on your team, you know? And it's it's very, because there's only so much room on the factory floor, right? But I always tell people that even when you're dealing with China or any supplier anywhere, like those relationships are so important. Um, Someone posted in one of the groups this morning, they said, you know, when should I negotiate an MOQ? Should it be before I get a sample or after? And I said, um, well, first of all, you don't want to negotiate an MOQ, like what supplier wants to work with someone that, you know, how little can I order from you, right? And, right. and it should should never be about that. But then the second thing is like, take the time to have a conversation, like reach out before you ask for samples, reach out and have a conversation so that you know that this is a good partner for you, that they're actually going to want to work with you because how horrible would it be to get a sample? And yeah, it's a great sample, but this is a terrible partner, you know? So I love that you mentioned like, I reached out to these guys and it just was good vibes from the very beginning. It was a good partnership. Now, as far as other products, like, do you know anything about other products that are made in Pakistan? Uh, um, I, I, I know Pakistan has a very strong textile market. I know they do huge business in towels, sheets. Um, I also know that um, they do a lot of leather goods. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they do sporting equipment, soccer balls, that kind of stuff. Like they have a good manufacturing base. Um, one of the things I can talk about too is is you know we talk about pricing, right? Mm-hmm. Like when my guys came on when I first started working with them, their pricing was really low, right? Because like let's be honest, like any kind of supplement stuff there's generally room in there, but my pricing is is really low, and at the same time, like I'm I, I'm I'm like I I pay attention to stuff. I know that the Pakistani currency has dropped by 30, 40% against the US dollar over the last five years, right? They have not, I've not asked for a decrease in the price. And they haven't, you know, the guy kind of mentioned, he goes, Miriam, you're going to squeeze on price. I'm not going to squeeze you guys on price. The price I'm paying for my products is a fair price. I'm getting a top tier product. I get what I want, how I want it. I'm okay paying the price because, to be honest with you, like my material cost is incidental to my packaging and everything else right so i'm okay paying the price because it's a fair price and still leaves me a lot of room on the table right like i wrote a i wrote a rant uh, a few few months ago i put on facebook if you saw it or not basically saying hey you know what be a good customer you know don't sit there and squeeze the crap out of every single deal where the guy's like why should we do this we're not gonna make any money on it right Mm -hmm. so it's got to go both ways so you want a good supplier but you also want to be a good customer. Yeah, it you know, needs to be good for them. I'm always it, reminding reminding my suppliers, you know, like, hey, I, I do need this price. Like, this is my target price. But at the same time, like, I need to make money. But I also want you to make money. I need both of us to be happy in this situation, right? And I need our customers to be happy, right? So how can we work together? Like, let's figure it out. If if this price doesn't work for you at this level of this product, is there anything we can do? Like, can we change out a material and still keep the same quality? Let's work together and figure it out, you know, because I agree, it, it has to be a situation where everybody's making money and, and because otherwise who's gonna wanna work for you? 
Well, well, right? It, well, it's like I had um I had an episode a few weeks ago. I use a small contract warehouse, and it's a small operation. They have like four or five employees, right? They do my fulfillment for me, and I introduce a new task for them where they're sending some of my inventory to Amazon or Walmart for me. And the guy's like, well, we'll just bill you, you know, an hourly rate. Thank you, Tim. Uh, bill you an hourly rate for this, whatever else, right? And I'm like, you're underbilling me. He goes, what? I said, you are underbilling me for the service. He goes, well, char you charge me by the hour, but that hourly rate you're charging me, you're not including your overhead, your your air conditioning, electricity and stuff. I said, you got to charge me more and let's do it on a per piece basis. And I'm not doing that because, oh, I'm a sweet guy and I'm all kumbaya. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want these guys, when I pick up a phone call, they're eager to talk to me. Hey, Miro, what can we do for you, right? Right, yeah, you um, want it to be a true partnership. I, I do, like, what happened is our operations really grown, and we don't have a forklift, we don't have a warehouse. So we used to get shipments into our parking lot, okay? They drop off 50 pallets, then we would unload 50 pallets by hand into our office facility, then we have to break up all the pallets. It was, it was like a day project where there's like 10 of us out there just killing ourselves, right? So I dumped this job onto my warehouse. And now they receive it because they have, they have a warehouse. They pick up the forklift, put it on the shelf. They charge me 200 bucks. And it was mm -hmm. like, it's saving like a day of hell of just having crap scattered everywhere and making a mess. Right, and right. That kind of stuff. So absolutely build the relationships, be nice. Not being nice because, oh, kumbaya, we love business. Hey, it's good business. Yes, exactly. I love that. Partnerships are so important. You want to be there for the long run. So what about finding these suppliers? So you mentioned a lot of different great products from Pakistan, textiles, stuff like that. Tori asked, do they have a trade show? Is there a supplier database that you know of? Um, Ali mentioned um, that I'm guessing, Ali, you may be from Pakistan, um, that there's a couple of trade shows, but nothing substantial happened lately because of obviously COVID. Nobody's been going to trade shows um, and it's really hard to, to throw off, um, uh, to, to throw a trade show digitally in some countries. So do you know of any supplier databases or anything? Uh, my suggestion would be, it sounds kind of goofy, like in the US, the Chamber of Commerce is really just like a, some that are even for profit, they're basically just loose organizations of business sources, right? But over there, the trade organizations, they're an important thing. Like they're really, like it's a very prestigious thing to be members of these communities. So I would say go after the trade associations in Pakistan and look through their list and also, you know, find out what you can. Um, a favorite comment I have is, hey, look, the internet, it's not just for dirty pictures anymore, okay? <laughs> you can look up other stuff, right? Uh, and, and my suppliers, did not have a slick website, but I'm doing the math. Like they've been in business for 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a really good reputation, a lot of distribution. But again, these guys are not focusing on their web presence. They're focusing on building products. So if you see somebody that's running, like, you know, if you look somebody up and their, and their website looks like it was last updated in like, you know, 92, don't, don't run away from that. Cause that tells you that these guys may not be focusing on their web presence. And if they were, maybe they wouldn't need you. Right, exactly. Yeah. So in this case, you know, one of my little hacks whenever I get messages from people on LinkedIn, you know, hawking their services, as I say, send me your website and I'll judge you based on that. And then we'll be in touch if I'm interested. And that that usually that gets rid of 90 percent of them. Right. But um, in this case, I think you're right. You know, the, even really good manufacturers that I found in China, they don't necessarily have great websites and and that's okay because if i can get on the phone with them get on a, even a video chat and have them show me around and have a good relationship and a good conversation like you said if they've been in business for 50 years and they're really good at what they do they're going to be a good partner for you hopefully so that's that's really a great tip to look up trade organizations don't be afraid to google it don't be afraid to pick up uh, the phone and talk to other, you like you did with homeopathic providers and say, hey, where are you finding this stuff? Really just reach out and get into your industry and find out what's going on. I love that. That is a really great thing. So the other hack that you gave, Mira, which I thought was gold, is you said that your, um, your supplier, they shipped you the product, but it was in really terrible packaging that just wasn't good. So my, I have a couple of questions for you there. 
I love that you took advantage of repackaging and rebranding the products here to be more appealing um, to a U.S. customer base, but also that you didn't let that stop you from sourcing. So my question would be, um, I know in China, it's kind of a one-stop shop, right? Like we can go to one supplier and they're going to have a printing supplier. They're going to have a packaging supplier and you can kind of get everything done at one factory. Well, that might not be the case in Pakistan, right? They might not have as much in paper or packaging goods. Um, so was there a reason that you didn't go to your supplier in Pakistan and ask them to now do your packaging? Was it just not available to you or was it just easier to package in the U.S.? Well, what happens is because the FDA regulations in supplements changes, like it's so dynamic, right? Something I could have said last month, I can't say anymore, right? You got to make certain claims and diseases, certain things you can, can and can't do. And what we found was we needed that ability to adapt to the market. Like, let me give you an example. We had a product for teething, for babies' teething products, right? And one of our competitors ended up putting a herb in it that was actually harmful to people, right? So the FDA came down like a giant hammer and said, you know, you can't have any more teething products, right? They actually took my teething products out of my shipment and they put it to a landfill and they had a guy in a hazmat suit on a bulldozer run it over, okay? Like, this is kind of what we deal with. It's really crazy. And oh my gosh. Uh, so that product now is kind of creeping out a little bit, but now they're calling it oral pain. It's the same product, same formulation, but now it's got a different name. So we have to have that ability to really, um, you know, change our packaging on the fly and what we do. And we, having that in-house is very good. Like, it's kind of funny because, because I'm doing the packaging here, we've created a whole white label business and we're actually a wholesale supplier to other people that want to do supplements, both for humans and animals. And some of our um, animal people are just just crushing it. I got one lady who's doing like over a million a year in her second year. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. So what, what we did kind of as a starting point to improve our products appeal and packaging has kind of become a safeguard for the business. We're able to, to pivot more quickly and just created a whole new business line for us. We're acting as a wholesale supplier. So what you think is kind of a, a negative at first turns out to be a positive. Because now you're able to white label your products to others yep. and you're able to create additional um, streams of income for your business, which is so cool. Um, and you've essentially become a supplier. So, exactly. I mean, that is an incredible opportunity and something for all of us to think about. Think about all the different ways that you can source from many different places and think about, you know, there's lots of printing capability right here in the US. There's lots of packaging capability. There's no reason, or wherever you're from, there's no reason not to take advantage of that. Now, what about infrastructure? I know, you know, something that I learned about India um, is that the infrastructure is nothing like it is in China, right? Where when you <laughs> when you leave, when your products leave the factory in China, you can expect them to get to the nearby port pretty quickly with minimal interruption. Well, in India, they're having to drive quite a way over like dirt roads and you never know, something could get broken, something could get, you know, put in the, is it like that in Pakistan as well? It's a very mountainous region. Um, it's, it's maybe the roadways aren't as good. Is that a concern or something that people should be aware of when sourcing from Pakistan? Um, I, actually, the, 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 the trends has actually been better for me than a lot of people in China because we haven't had the same kind of, like when, uh, when they're doing the, 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 the extra tariffs on China didn't affect me at all. Um, they have this big clog at, at the West Coast ports right now where all the ports are shut down, all the boats are sitting in the ocean waiting. doesn't affect us because we're able to um, just, it come, my stuff comes in through New York, comes on the East Coast. It really has been a problem. Some of people don't realize, like, the biggest misconception of Pakistan is that some little dirt road country, and they have a lot of, like, the fringes it's near Afghanistan and stuff. But the actual, like, the, the capital and the big cities, like, 80% of our pharmaceutical drugs are made in Pakistan. Like, these guys have a very educated workforce, very high-end stuff. They've got infrastructure in place. Like, my stuff gets on the truck, goes on the truck, 
from Lahore, the capital. It goes to, uh, I can't remember the name of the port city. The port city. They put her in a queue. It goes on a boat. You know, the boat makes like 20 stops along the way. And I'm, I'm watching the boat. I don't know if anybody else, do you guys do this? Is you, you get to the name of the ship and you watch the ship on the little map and where it goes. Do you guys do that? That is so much fun. <laughs> No, I've never done that before. No, but it, it sounds if, like fun. If you look up the name of the ship, there's these websites that actually track the ship for you, right? So sometimes when I'm out of stock, I'll be off the ship. I'm like, why is the ship stopped? Dude, come on. Get come on. Get <laughs> oh, going. Man. Oh no. I don't know that I need that in my life right now. Like <laughs> I shipped something, I shipped something from China January 20th, I think it left, and it's I'm still waiting. It's no, look so up the frustrating. Ship. <laughs> I, I, oh no, I, I can't. Lady it's, is the ship. it's probably it's probably like sitting in port for a month now, you know, because there's so many delays. So speaking of that, I, before we before, because I want to ask you about duties and stuff, because, um, you know, uh, we have this this comment here from Aditya that says, when we source from outside, it just becomes too expensive. I'm guessing you're sourcing from Pakistan uh, with the customs duty on top of what we already have, the Amazon referral fee, closing fee, shipping and packing fee. Yep, that makes sense. Um, and then uh, Ali says, small home-based industries are pretty good at providing limited quantities, including handicrafts. So you can source small quantities, which is another benefit of sourcing from um, countries like Pakistan and, and, um, and the like, right? Because you can source small things. So definitely check those out depending on your, what, your, what it is that you're sourcing. Um, so the question I have for you is you mentioned in your post, and this was like made my ears perk up. I was like, Ooh, wait a minute. Um, you said you don't pay the kind of tariffs that we pay um, coming from China, the 20, 25% tariffs. So talk to us about that. Like, how do you, first of all, set, do you just contact any old freight forwarder? Um, what about inspections and quality control? Let's let's talk through inspections, quality control, and then let's talk through some importing and import duties and stuff. So maybe we start with quality control because that's like the next step in the process, right? So normally before my products leave, I leave the country, I leave the factory, I get them inspected to you know AQL standards. So what do you do, Miro? How do you get your stuff inspected and how do you find inspectors in places like Pakistan? Mostly I think positive. Um... <laughs> Because, because uh, Pakistan has a very mature pharmaceutical industry, uh, that type of manufacturing is very closely regulated within Pakistan. They have good manufacturing practices, and the government has a very strong interest in making sure that everything is you know safe and proper as it should be. Right. right? So inspection isn't really a thing that I do. I just don't feel it's necessary. Right. Um, I've got a good trust in my supplier, and, and so far everything's just been like I've never. I, I think out of like, I'm going to say millions of units, I've had maybe one or two where the seal was broken in transport. Like it really has been, the, the quality has just been spectacular, right? Uh, so I haven't worried about quality. The next thing is the tariffs. Because of the political situation, the U.S. has, has a lot of presence militarily in Pakistan, right? So I guess in order to butter, butter up the government, they provide like a preferred trade status to it. So depending on what you're what you're bringing in, generally the tariffs are either nothing or they're very nominal. Uh, we used to be in a different category, and my tariffs would be like maybe a thousand bucks on a forty thousand dollar order, and now I think they're down to a couple hundred bucks. It's just it's it's incidental to to the cost of the product. Wow! Wow! Well, we have a lot of comments over here in the feed. Like everybody's really having good conversations. Thank you, Tori. Hey, Justin, just saying hello. Hey, Raheel. Hey, Yusuf. Ali. Lots of great um, conversation here. So uh, I love that, you know, but either way, if you don't have to worry about inspection, that is nice. But if we're making something that's more like handicraft and that we want to a certain level, um, do you know if there are any inspection companies there? Um, maybe we just have to hit up the Googles for that. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't really have. I don't really have a. Um, I don't really have a. What do you call it? A, a, a resource for you there. 
my my experience, like I've had some Pakistani VAs in the past that were not successful for me. Um, I like anywhere else, you, you you have your scammers and you have people who know what they're doing, right? And it's just a matter of like you can't take it personally. You're a business person. You hire people. You hire an employee. They suck. You hide the body. You got another one. If they suck. You hide that body, and then eventually you find a good one. You keep them. It's it's the same kind of thing. You look. You're in business. You're a grown up. You find somebody. You try them out. If if they if they're crappy, um, I would actually suggest like I have not done this yet, but I've got a plan in November. I'm actually going to go meet my suppliers in person, which is I'm kind of excited about doing that because we've been you know working together for so long. It's going to be kind of cool. But I would say, you know, if you're going to buy any kind of quantity, get on a plane. I mean, there's flights from Miami to Islamabad for like 900 bucks. Get on a plane. Go look at the stuff yourself. Go look at the factory. Go see the people. Um, you yeah. know. Th- I would 100% that- agree. Like in terms of you also contracts, you know, you can have contracts to somewhat protect yourself if you can't make it over there on a plane, but you can at least have a good relationship with your supplier. You can ask for pictures. You can communicate your requirements because most of the time a failed inspection is due to a miscommunication of requirements or lack of communication of requirements. I can't tell you how many times people have gotten a sample or something from their supplier and they've been like, oh, this thing is, this is a mess. And it's like, Okay, well, did you expect them to read your mind or did you give them a quality spec document and did you communicate your requirements back and forth? Did you have good conversations? Um, I think most of it can be really, you know, due to lack of communication. And so it's really all about those relationships and communication back and forth along the way. Um, Don't be afraid to ask for a video of something close up or, you know, of if if you're concerned about the fabric stretching, have them stretch it for you. You know, like they want to make quality stuff for you. And if they have a problem with that, then, you know, that's a red flag. Would you say yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think also it's important to have realistic expectations, right? If you say to someone, "Hey, I, I've got like this this cell phone which is eight hundred bucks. I want you to make it for me for two hundred. No, that's not realistic, right? I mean, you got to adjust your expectations to the realm of reality. Um, you're going to have to absolutely send me samples. I'll pay the DHL two day shipping, whatever it's a hundred bucks. Send me a sample. Pull pull three off the line. Put an envelope. And send it down. Let me have a look at it. Right. Yeah. Um, I I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Like the suppliers, and I'm going to generalize here a little bit. Like I grew up in Toronto, Canada, so I grew up with a lot of Pakistani friends and people that I knew. Right. And you know, like I said, I, I was somewhat familiar with the culture and kind of the attitude and the stuff. So I had, had didn't, have a, didn't have a specific problem with it. But my suppliers have been like highest level of integrity, highest level of professionalism. Like I said, nothing but but positive things to say about my relationship with them. And it's just a matter of finding people that, that, that you have that with, that you have that ability with. That's like, awesome. Like we just changed our packaging for one of our products that they make. And they put like, you know, that thick cardboard with magnetic closure on there. And they called me up. They're like, Miro, we have we have this new packaging. We're excited about it. And I'm like, okay, what's the cost? It's an extra 50 cents. I'm like, do it. You sure? I'm like, yeah. Like 50 cents. This is something that I sell for $100, right? 50 cents, knock yourselves out, guys. You know, I'm cool. Love that. Yeah. I mean, so it's it's so important. Like, no matter where you're sourcing from, it's important to know your requirements. It's important to know what makes a good partner for you. It's important to not... Um, not pinch your supplier out of their last dime and really be a good customer, be a good partner, find the right partner for you. If you can't inspect it yourself, um, you know, have that communication going. And then you mentioned packaging, explore white label opportunities, explore your opportunity to repackage something. Uh, don't be afraid to use the internet. Oh my goodness, we've learned so many messages, so many lessons here talking to you today. One more question for you, importing. And you know, you mentioned like the tariffs, the, the importing um, fees and everything are quite minimal, but 
how do you find like is it hard to find a freight forwarder you know obviously for china it's they're very easy to find um but do you have any advice about shipping and finding shipping and importing and and finding the right uh, provider for that um uh, my suppliers like when i started this i didn't know anything like about the whole process, right? So my spires put this stuff on a boat for me. Here you go, right? They they have a uh, a freight forward that they've worked with before. I've got a customs broker here in uh, Orlando that I use, and the first couple times I had stuff come in, we didn't have the paperwork done properly because we didn't know what the hell we were doing, right? So the FDA ended up holding my first shipment for like three months. It went back and forth, back and forth, and then I learned along the way how to do it. Like one thing I'll tell people is, you know, when you start this journey, you're going to screw up, you're going to fail, you're going to do stuff. And that's how you learn, right? Once you figure it out, like um, we talk about, you, you know, I talk about how I have to re-educate our FDA inspector every year. They give us a new one, right? I have like this 30-page email with charts and graphs and links to different websites and the FDA website and their own stuff. This is all together, right? So the first time I did it, it took me like a month to put this crap together, but now it's done. So now when we get the FDA stuff going, here's your email, here's your references, here's who you talk to. Um, the chief uh, FDA inspector for the state of Florida, ladies on a first name basis with me, I call her up. I'm like, I know a bit of Spanish because my wife is Mexican, right? So ladies, Spanish, I'm talking, hola, que paso, you know, throw my 10 words of Spanish at her. You know, you got to kiss a little ass sometimes and you do that, um, you know, you just, you, you figure it out. Right, right. So I love that. You, you figure it out every step of the way. I'll never forget my first time um, finding a freight forwarder. I was like, just thinking, you know, this can't be so hard. I don't trust just somebody in a Facebook group sending me a message. I want to find a legitimate business. So I hit up the Googles. I looked at websites. I made some phone calls. I did some interviews and I found Brownstone International here in the US. They're also a licensed customs broker and they were so nice and they took the time to really explain everything to me and educate me. And I've trusted them ever since then. And they've been, you know, my trusted freight forwarder from, for any country, really, they're, they're really good at, at doing importing and exporting. But I think that's the bottom line is, you know, and this has been a constant theme throughout this interview with you, Miro, is just like, there's nothing wrong with learning. You're going to make mistakes and it just good business to have conversations, figure things out, find good partners and um, source from the places that are best for you and best for your customers, right? Well, you know, I, I've, I've got a, a lot of my friends kind of see what I'm doing in my business and they want to get into it. I've gotten a few of my friends into it. And what I do now is I use a couple of these coaches that help guide me and get me going. So now I just tell people, look, you want to do this business, hire these coaches and they'll drag you through it and they'll take you through it step by step because I don't have the attention span for it, right? <laughs> and um, But what's really cool is I got a friend of mine He's a big guy, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but the guy's like 100% foot on the gas, right? And, and he runs into the wall sometimes, but he gets ahead and he makes money because he's doing stuff. And I think that's the biggest that's the biggest flaw, I guess, in our modern society is we have too much information. And we're like, maybe I should source from here. Maybe I should source from here. You know what? Whether you're sourcing from China or Pakistan or something, just get started. Like, do some baby steps. Like, um, it's funny because I got I have an Airbnb that I rent out and I buy tons of towels because people steal um, towels like crazy, right? I've bought a towels from four different suppliers. It's the same towels made in Pakistan. Four different guys selling them. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. so you just you never know. But as long as it's good pricing and good opportunities, hey, I just want to say hi to Justin and say hi to Sai. Simon's here. And um, and then we have that uh, some more info here um, where Ali is saying that um, pharmaceutical bulk exports are massive along with agricultural products and the famous pink Himalayan salt. I love pink salt. Oh, so do I. It's, it's great stuff. <laughs> well, you know, what's, yeah, I can tell you guys a salt story. I'm in Big Lots. I love Big Lots. And they had these giant glass jars of I mean, salt salts for like uh, the pink salt for like three bucks. 
And I was like, I, like I'd buy it off the shelves and resell it because it was like forty bucks for the salt and this giant, beautiful glass decanter thing. I'm like, wow, this is gorgeous. And um, it was one of these export to buy. And I called coming to the guy. They said we just bought like a, they bought like five containers that were from Pakistan. And they got a crazy deal on them, right? But I'm like, I was so sell this thing. Like just the glass decanter had to be worth like would retail for like forty, fifty bucks. It was beautiful. And you found it at Big Lots. There's I bought like, so- ten of them. There's so many sourcing opportunities right in front of our eyes that we don't even realize. And I think a lot of people just don't even realize the potential to repackage something, rebrand it, make it their own, just like you've done. And, you know, you could take that giant thing of salt, repackage it, make it amazing, you know? Uh, I got to say something, Amy. Our journey, we were on our probably sixth complete label and packaging redesign. We've gone from little tiny plastic bottles with like a, a white printed label to a foil printed label we printed on our inkjet printers. And now we're in glass bottles, high quality glass bottles with this like $10,000 laser printer that prints like 3000 DPI, like photograph quality. And the packaging is so much more important than you think it is. Whatever you think, like each time we've changed our packaging, our sales have doubled. Like each oh, time. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous that you know, that you're thinking, oh, I got like, you're going to laugh at this. When I first started selling, someone said, hey, you should sell on Amazon. Here's my answer. I don't want to pollute my brand by selling online. Like, it, what a dumbass. If I had gotten into it <laughs> back then, I'd be in private jet money right now. Like, oh, my <laughs> God. You're still, you're still going to get there, Miro. You're going to oh. get there. And then I want to ride, okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes, locking that in. You guys heard it. You heard it. He said it. Um, <laughs> so I would love to ask you before we get off here, you have really had some experience creating your own packaging. And you said you bought your own printers for packaging and stuff. And I've actually, you know, my my um, cat litter box cleaner that's made in the U.S., I had to get my packaging from the U.S. And I actually started outsourcing my packaging to China because they do a better job and it's actually much better price. And my prices here for packaging at some of the the you know packaging manufacturers were just ridiculous. So like for example, my full color box that I just like redid with re, um, for retail packaging has a window in it. It's full color. It has like four different colors on the outside of the box. It's um it's a big box, right? Um that my supplier here, um, my packaging supplier here quoted me like $3 a box for. And I was like, man, that just doesn't seem right. And I contacted James at Pactipus in China. Um, I met him. He's from, he's actually from Boston and he moved to China and started his own packaging company. And I ended up paying 83 cents a box and he shipped it anywhere in China free for me. And I just threw it on a, a out with one of my shipments that was coming out from another supplier. And so it worked out just fine. But for those people that are wanting to take advantage of packaging here in the U.S. and, re, you know, I see that all the time people want to get started. And I tell them, I'm like, hey, just go get some boxes, get really professional full color stickers printed and just start. You know, so what advice do you have for folks that are wanting to do some packaging in the U.S. and, um, you know, good providers and, and how do they get started in, in packaging in the U.S.? Um, most places have a paper supplier. Like I used to use a, a standard cardboard, corrugated cardboard box. All my stuff is little, right? I have, I have a couple things that are bigger, uh, but most of my stuff is little. Um, so printing stickers is expensive, especially in smaller quantities because it's so much work, right? So my suggestion is always, you know, in the online world, I tell people who's ever getting into it, your opinion doesn't matter. Your thoughts don't matter. You test. The market will tell you what it wants. My top 10 selling products, never in a million years would I have picked them to be the top selling products. The top 10 selling products are completely different on Amazon than they are on Walmart, than they are on Shopify. Like it's you just it's a different it's a different world, right? So I'm gonna say, you know what, you got a product, do something quick and dirty. I don't care if you're paying 10 bucks a box. See what works. Then once you have it working, then you go back and you do that. Like actually, I mean, I wouldn't mind that supplier name for you from China. Because what we're doing right now is we're doing a generic box and we're doing a sticker 
a full color sticker around the generic box. So I wouldn't mind a generic box supplier. So I, I'm interested in that contact, if you don't mind sharing that with yes, me. Yes, absolutely. That. Yes, I will send um, it to you. Yeah, I went out and bought myself this. Like, I tried 10 different things. I bought myself this Affinia label printer. And it's like these big commercial printers are kind of a pain in the butt. Like, you, you, certain things work better than other things. And I finally got it dialed in where if I use a glossy paper label, not the Bebop, right? I get this amazing result. It'll print like 10,000 labels at a time, no issues. And it, it costs money, but I'm able to pivot so quickly. And also build in one thing, like I'm a creative guy, I like to jump around and do stuff. You really got to build your processes, right? Once your sales start coming up, you got to say, hey, look, before we'd repackage stuff, I'd say, hey, look, make 20 of these. Then I'd print the labels, then I'd put the barcodes, then we do this stuff. And now when I go to my production team, I give them like a tray. The tray has labels, barcodes, recipe, what we need, and the shipping label of final boxes. So changing that on the front end really saved me a lot of headache because, you know, in anything, your printer goes down, you're out of ink, the computer crashes. We had a print, like stuff happens. So this way, if you're ahead of the game and everything, there's no more bottlenecks. Yes. I love that. That's so smart. So I'm going to put my packaging supplier on the ticker for everyone so you can see it. Um, <laughs> he's James is about to get a lot of business and he's uh, I already send him a lot of business because he's just a good, good guy and he takes good care of people. And he also does uh, photography in China. So anybody who needs it. So my favorite packaging supplier in China is uh, Pactipus, P-A-C-K-T-Y-P-U-S. And um, the owner's James, and he is actually Chinese, but he lived in Boston, and he's just he started his business there. And you guys can contact him, and he's really, really good. And um, Miro, of course, I'll follow up with you and, and give you his, his contact personally, uh, so you one, have it. One more thing to throw out here: uh, again, people in, in in America aren't really that like I travel a lot, and I, I kind of grew up internationally, so I understand this a little better. When you call Pakistan. Everybody in Pakistan is educated in English. Every single person there speaks English. Like, oh, that's that, good to know. Like every single, oh, it's some kind of crazy foreign country. No, they can all speak English there. I mean, depending on where they are, they may have a like an accent you're not familiar with, but you can communicate in writing and very well with people, and that's a plus because, it, you know, like I've been trying to get in the German market, and the Germans gotta love them, but it's you speak German or screw you, like they don't care, like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, I had one guy call. I talked to one guy. I'm trying to get some custom stuff done there, to bring my products in there. He goes, "Look, he goes, you know what? He goes, tell you what? I go, what? He goes, he goes, call me back when you learn German." And he hung up on me. <gasps> no, <are> you <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you ugly son of a bitch. I'm <laughs> so mad. I lived kidding? in I lived in Germany for a while um, when I was in the military, and um, and I just want to include this here. H Humzuk says uh, I'm totally messing up that name. By the way, you guys have to teach me for textile, sports, salt, spices, pharmaceutical products. Huge sourcing potential. Thanks to Tim for exploring. Hope this encourages other as well. Awesome. Um, Yes. Sai says he's got to fly. Thanks for the nuggets. Well, thank you guys for being here today. You know, you've taught us so much, Miro, and I, this has been a great conversation today. And uh, I thank you so much. All right. One final piece of advice, Miro, that you have for everybody. Give everyone a nugget of business advice. So people just considering getting started, um, what's your best piece of advice? Um. Be courageous and just, just, just like close your eyes and run blindly forward. Um, you know, over the year, over my career, I've had some ups and downs in business. And after you get burned a few times, you kind of, you know, you get your heart broken and you don't want to do it anymore. You get a little more cautious with it. And I'm going to say, absolutely, do not tread carefully. Do not, you know, just, just, just go full out because what happens is we're in a market that's exploding. It's still exploding. And if you miss out, you're gonna you're gonna be really upset. And just just try. It. It's okay to fail. It's okay to lose money. It's okay to screw up. Right? Just just hide the bodies and move on. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes. Fail fast. Keep going. Just do it. Don't 
don't sit and wait forever, right? Just get moving. Well, Miro, thank you so much. I know everybody learned so much and people are going to start exploring Pakistan for, you know, for some sourcing opportunities and, and then also exploring some packaging opportunities elsewhere as well. So I think you opened a lot of people's eyes today, including mine. I thank you so much for your friendship and for your support and for sharing your story with our community. And uh, thanks everybody for being here and we'll see you next time. And bye, have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Amy, thanks for your time today.